This video will present different species of fish that are difficult to quarantine and provide strategies to use to help improve your success rate with these. Let's jump right to wrasses, which many seem to have difficulty quarantining. I even like to call them pain in my wrasse, but not all species are difficult to quarantine. The ones from the genre listed on the screen generally do well in quarantine. The most important thing to remember about them is that they need sand for burrowing and sleeping at night. So place some reef grade sand, preferably the same kind as you use in your display tank, in a glass bowl or in a corner of the quarantine tank for them. They also are usually not finicky feeders, so brine or mice or shrimp should suffice to get them eating. Now we move on to the more difficult wrasses to quarantine. Fairy and flasher wrasses don't always ship well, especially the large terminal or super males, so it would be better to acquire a smaller specimen, especially if ordering online. These wrasses generally don't appreciate medication being used on them right away, and they flat out don't like being in a bare bottom quarantine tank. So I try to make the QT as natural looking as possible by using plastic plants and a light layer of sand on the bottom. I also recommend preconditioning by offering small meals several times per day before using any medications. I would try frozen mysis or brine shrimp or live brine shrimp or black worms if you have access to those. Some finicky specimens may only eat something like frozen calanus or cyclops to start, or you can try a high quality pellet food such as TDO Chroma Boost. Possum wrasses are cryptic by nature and will hide a lot in quarantine, usually behind a pump, filter, intake, or heater. So you have to target feed them by shooting food at their hiding spot using a pipette. Also, their small mouth means you should try offering something small and meaty, like calanus or cyclops, or a frozen nano blend. You may even need to hatch baby brine shrimp for finicky specimens. The good news is that these little wrasses are fairly tolerant of copper and other medications. Leopard wrasses need sand for burrowing in a low light environment until they adjust to captivity. For the first few days, I typically only use ambient light until the fish is eating on a regular basis. Feeding is very challenging because you have to wait for the wrasse to emerge from the sand. This oftentimes only happens at night with a new specimen, so you'll have to keep checking the quarantine tank and always have food ready. Leopard wrasses eat small crustaceans and copepods in nature, so your best bet is something small and meaty like calanus, cyclops, fish eggs, prawn eggs, or oyster eggs. You may even need to hatch baby brine shrimp or dose live copepods for the damn thing. And abscess species wrasses are very similar to leopard wrasses with regards to quarantine requirements, but they're even more sensitive to lighting because they are deep water wrasses. Both leopard and anapsis wrasses are fairly tolerant of copper, prosipro, and other medications. The primary challenge is getting them to eat and adapt to a captive environment. It helps to offer plenty of hiding places, use plastic plants, and a light layer of sand on the bottom of the aquarium. You can even add live rock to the quarantine tank, provided you remove it prior to dosing medications. Antheus are difficult to quarantine because it can be challenging to get them to eat something other than live copepods. Also, larger species typically adapt easier to aquarium life than small deep water species. You can try offering frozen mysis or brine shrimp, are TDO Chroma Boost pellets to start. But if that doesn't do the trick, you will gradually have to offer more difficult to source foods such as frozen calanus, cyclops, fish eggs, prawn eggs, or oyster eggs, or live brine shrimp and live copepods. Make sure the quarantine tank itself has plenty of hiding spots by using multiple PVC elbows and plastic plants. Do not use chloroquine with antheus. However, once your fish are eating well, I would consider lacing their fish food with metronidazole as antheus can be prone to internal parasites. Everybody wants a copper band butterfly, as seen at top right, but most of the time the fish starves to death in quarantine. When quarantining butterfly fish, you have to be prepared by having an assortment of food on hand due to their finicky nature. You can try the frozen foods listed on the screen, 
but they may need to move on to live black worms or white worms to entice a specimen to eat. Live brine shrimp is also worth trying. Another option is to try a clam, muzzle, or oyster on the half shell. These can usually be sourced from a local seafood market or the seafood section of your grocery store. Another strategy is to try placing the food in a feeding grid. Copper bands and other butterfly fish are used to picking at food inside a crevice. If all else fails, consider easier butterfly fish to keep in quarantine. For example, a long-nosed butterfly fish, as seen on the bottom right, is much easier to get eating and adapts more quickly to aquarium life. And they are just as reef safe as a copper band butterfly. Most tangs, especially Zebrasoma species, are not difficult to quarantine. However, certain tangs have specific quirks or requirements to take into consideration. Anchantheris, especially Achilles, need a lot of dissolved oxygen in the water, as they are usually collected in crest zones, so I highly recommend providing strong water flow for them. In addition, run multiple air stones on high or point a couple of wave makers towards the surface of the water to increase gas exchange in the quarantine tank. Tanakitas tanks are extremely timid, especially at first, so you may need to walk away from the quarantine tank after feeding to convince them to come out. Hippo tanks are just very bizarre, strange fish, especially for a tang. They will often lie flat down on the bottom of a quarantine tank or wedge themselves in between a heater and the glass. This can sometimes be a problem if the heater starts to burn their skin. They are also notorious for scratching, even if they don't have parasites or worms, and will often develop bacterial tufts or viral nodules either during quarantine or post-quarantine. Nasotangs can be difficult to get eating. Oddly enough, I have found that live blackworms are often their first favorite food. All tangs need nori in quarantine. However, there are two important things to remember when offering nori in quarantine. Number one. Only feed a little at a time to prevent uneaten pieces from floating into the water column and clogging your filters. Number two, if medications like copper are in the water, you sometimes have to soak the nori in RODI or clean salt water for 10 to 20 seconds before adding it to the quarantine tank. The idea is to get it to absorb the RODI instead of the copper in the QT water. The primary challenge associated with quarantining angelfish is their sensitivity to copper. They will usually tolerate copper, but it's best to raise it slowly, gradually, and keep a close eye out for signs of copper intolerance. This can include lethargy, heavy breathing, and appetite suppression. Angels are also prone to flukes, so you will want to deworm with Prozipro during the quarantine period. Most angels will eat prepared foods, but some species are notorious for being finicky. These include regal angels, rock beauties, Singapore, flagfin, scribbled, and some members of the Genocanthus genus. Genocanthus are also prone to swim bladder disorders. For finicky angels, you should first try angelfish specific food formulations which contain sponge meat, as shown on the screen on bottom left. Live foods, and clams, mussels, oysters on the half shell are also worth a shot. Unlike butterflies, most angels are omnivores, so you can also try nori and other greens to entice them to eat. Gobies are not always difficult to quarantine, but they have special requirements that you should know about. One, most gobies are prone to jumping, so a tight-fitting lid is a must. It's best to use screen because gobies can fit through small holes in an aquarium top. Two, try to only purchase large, healthy-looking specimens. Avoid small, scrawny gobies with pinched or sunken in stomachs. These usually have internal parasites which need to be treated with metronidazole. You can food soak Seachem Metroplex, API General Cure, or Fritz Paracleanse if you have a goby like this. Three, Gobies are sometimes outcompeted for food by faster fish in the quarantine tank. This is happening. Target feed your goby by shooting food right at it using either a pipette or turkey baster. The goby will eventually figure out that the pipette or turkey baster means food and will actually swim up to it. 4. Sand sifting gobies need sand. 
either in a glass bowl or in a corner of the quarantine tank for them. Quarantining dragon ants presents two major challenges. First, they are generally considered to be intolerant of copper, so it is best to do hybrid tank transfer method if you are wanting to treat prophylactically or if a specimen is known to be infected with ichor velvet. Secondly, while captive bred mandarins may eat frozen food and sometimes even small pellets, wild caught specimens will sometimes only eat live pods, or some have had luck by hatching live baby brine shrimp. Remember, dragonets are slow, deliberate feeders. They peck at food, look around, scoot around, and then eat again. So I would avoid quarantining them with large, aggressive, or fast-eating fish. Ideally, they should be quarantined by themselves. First off, this is a fish you should only buy if you are committed to building a tank around them. They need a large, six-foot tank to really thrive, and you should only house a Moorish idol with smaller, non-aggressive tank mates because any aggression from other fish can cause a Moorish idol to sulk and stop eating, and sometimes they never resume. Okay, keeping that in mind, it can sometimes be difficult to get a new Moorish idol to start eating. You should have a wide array of different foods on hand to try. Every Moorish idol I have ever owned has required a different starter food to get them going with eating. Live black worms or white worms, Live or frozen brine shrimp, frozen bloodworms, mice or shrimp, both the regular and PE mices, are good options to try. Clams, mussels, or oysters on the half shell might work. Or sometimes angelfish and butterfly fish food formulations do the trick. Try placing these in a feeding grid as the snout of a Moorish idol is designed to pick food out of crevices. Most idols will eat nori, and they can be voracious eaters of nori once they get going with it. I even had one Moorish idol that surprised the hell out of me by only wanting flake and pellets at first. You just never know. Once your Moorish idol starts eating, they will gradually get to a point where they will eat almost anything. This is a good thing because these fish have extremely high metabolisms. As such, you should feed your idol five to six times per day. Yes, you heard that right, five to six times per day. They need small but frequent meals to stay healthy. And eating Moorish Idol is usually pretty tolerant of copper and most other medications, but I wouldn't start off with any meds until the fish is eating. There are three other fish that are not necessarily difficult to quarantine, but they are prone to specific diseases for which you should consider preventative treatment in quarantine. Blue spot jawfish have their own disease named after them. There is general disagreement about whether it is a parasitic infestation or bacterial infection. Fortunately, treating for 10 to 14 days with both metronidazole and canamycin usually works if you start treatment before symptoms are present or symptoms are caught early on. Chromus damsels are very prone to a parasitic infestation known as uronema, which causes red sores on them. Daily formalin treatment can be used to treat asymptomatic fish. However, once red sores are present, your only hope of saving them is by doing tea tree oil baths. Melafix contains tea tree oil. As previously described, antheas are also prone to uronema, so a similar treatment regimen should be considered for antheas. I will post a link in the comments section about treating uronema. Clownfish are generally easy to quarantine, however they are also prone to brooklynella. The good news is dosing the water with metronidazole for 10 days usually eliminates this parasite. All of the fish listed here are considered copper intolerant. However, all except the seahorse and pipefish can be treated with chloroquine phosphate for parasites or hybrid tank transfer method. For seahorses and pipefish, formulin and nitrofurazone, which is an antibiotic, are primarily used to treat them. Thank you for watching this video. To see more videos like this one and periodic live streams, hit the subscribe button. Also, join us on my forum at humble.fish for all reef aquarium related discussion.